Well, uh, good for you. You know, good for you. It's, it seems like a very lovely place. I went into Sephora one time, and I felt like I was going to break out. The stuff was so expensive. I couldn't believe it. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to The Stern Spiel, a weekly podcast where I talk to my dad, Charlie Stern. Wait. That's me. Yeah, that's you. I'm and, Veronica uh, Stern. And I'm uh, Veronica's dad, and it's a weekly show where we talk about things that are going on in the world and in our lives. Mm-hmm. It's a father-daughter podcast. So, you know, the introduction still needs some work, but it's episode five, and I'm feeling interesting today. How are you feeling? It could be a good show. I mean, we have a couple of things. We, we thought a little more critically about what we're doing on this podcast. Yeah. Let's see if we can bring something to it without making it boring. Well, we'll see, but let's just start out with how are you doing? Answer no, the question. No, no, I'm hand. doing I'm doing okay. You so what you're saying is you need me to connect, listen, respond, <laughs> interactive, right? I'm doing well, Veronica. I'm doing better than I was this time last week or the last time we recorded the show. I got that prescription finally that I was complaining about. It was like a whole drama, and I'm prepared to talk a little bit about that today. Okay. Um, And how are you doing? I'm doing okay. What are the dog days of summer? I think of the dog days of summer as late July to mid-August oh, okay. when it's really hot and yeah. humid, which today it doesn't feel like that. No, it doesn't feel like that. Like the weather is finally breaking, like thank God, but I am feeling a little bit of the the, the dooms of the dog days okay. of summer. I well. just feel like it's so hot outside. I was in the city the other day and I am, it's like I want to avoid the subway, but I also want to avoid walking outside. It's like there's no way to go about it. In Manhattan, it's rough. If you have to go in and out of the subway, it's a sweat box. Yeah, and I'm just like tired. It's just, oh, God, I don't know, guys. I, I Do you like fall? I like all four seasons. No, that's not possible. No, you I like do. all four seasons. I do, for different things. I mean, I'm trying to be positive about it. You know, I mean, I, I, nobody loves the absolute worst of the ice and snow. Yeah. Nobody likes the worst of the hot. But there's good things about all seasons. But if you had to choose one season, summer. what would you choose and summer. why? Summer. Why? Um, because you get to wear shorts. You, it's easy. You know, you can you can walk around. It's comfortable most of the time. Okay. Um, I mean, if you don't feel like being outside, don't go outside. Stand in the shade. You can be comfortable. I would say that, that my favorite season is fall because I like it when it starts to become a little bit cold. Yep. Like the thing I don't like about spring is that spring, it starts to become warm. Like, I don't like that transition from cold to warm because Mm -hmm. when it's, when I have to like start becoming like, if if, like, for example, let's say I'm outside and I'm wearing a sweatshirt and it's just getting too hot because it's becoming spring. Mm -hmm. I hate that. I hate that feeling. I like, I like fall because it's hot becoming cold. And like, I like the idea that like, ooh, it's kind of chilly today. I need to wear a sweater rather than like, ooh, it's too hot today. I need to take my sweater off. Some people like that change of seasons because it's like a wardrobe opportunity. I can certainly understand that. Um, Seasons transition and we need to transition to another topic Dad, we've been talking for three minutes. No, I understand that. But I, you know, it's the weather, Veronica. Nobody wants to talk about the weather more than than a minute or two. And you know what? It's like, it's interesting weather today, but it could be totally different a week from now when people watch this. So listen, I do want to talk a little bit more about something though, because the show is about father-daughter communication (laughs) and I'm trying to impart something that I think that you will find valuable as you take this into your grown-up life. I can't, I can't, uh, what's the word, shield you from this indefinitely, what? okay? this is It's a consumer problem. I'm talking about prescription medicines. Again, I know I've been on a rant about it, but I want to talk about it in a broader context because I did a little bit of homework on okay. the subject, okay? And by the way, you sent me a very, very dense, useful link to a video that I believe was published by it's the Forbes C- magazine. No, it's a CNBC, like how it's Thank made you. video. Because yeah. I love watching those video it essays that they do. Great. It and was it was great. called Why CVS or Why like Chain Pharmacies Are Failing. And it was so funny because it was literally posted three days ago. Yep. It's, and we were just talking about and this. And this is, this is what the kind of stuff we need to talk about on this podcast. It has to be relevant to our lives relevant more broadly and if we can use something out there in the world as a jump off point i think it makes it much more interesting for everybody right you agree with that formula so you sent me this link to the to the uh 
CNBC uh, video, which we're going to put the link. We'll put the link into the show notes. Folks, you got to see this because it really tells the story. And I've experienced this on such a direct level. I've had four prescriptions in the past 90 days that I had difficulty either filling or getting the whole prescription or it was flat out rejected and I had to get a replacement. In one case, the, the replacement was rejected. So I've had this series of snafus like I really have never seen before with prescription medicines. It's like a problem, okay? Now, you know, I was prescribed this medicine to treat headaches. I don't want to get into my personal issues but it's important to get the medicine, okay? Mm -hmm. And it's one of these TV advertised medicines, which I don't know why we even have TV advertising for medicine. It means to me, like, leave that to the doctors. Why mm -hmm. do people need to walk into the doctor and say, well, I saw this medicine on TV. I'd like that. That doesn't seem like a good thing to me. It's my understanding that the United States is the only country in the world that has television advertising uh, for prescription medicine. We're going to set that aside for a second. This whole prescription medicine world is completely upside down, and it's much worse than I thought. So I brought some facts here with me. First of all, what I've discovered in the past month, and I knew some of this, but I didn't, I didn't, it wasn't hardened as an understanding. There's a lot of people in your life when you pick up a prescription at the drugstore. There's the pharmacy, the doctor, um, the insurance company. And then there's this other intermediary organization called a Pharmacy Benefit Manager, PBM. Have you ever heard of that? I heard about it today because I watched that video essay. So you watched the video and now you know. So, well, it turns out that the Pharmacy Benefit Manager is a third party. I'm going to read this. It's a third party administrator of prescription drug programs for health insurance plans, employers, and other organizations. Their role is to negotiate drug prices, maintain a list of what medicines may be dispensed, um, they get involved in processing prescription play, uh, prescription claims, um, and they do, quote-unquote, cost management. Sounds okay, except for one thing. Who owns them? The insurance companies. Right. So Cigna has a gigantic PBM called Express Scripts. So even though you're going to CVS to pick up your medicine, Express Scripts is a PBM owned by the insurance company, how's that even possible? And the, the entire distribution chain is controlled by the insurance companies, is what I'm trying to say. And then and, and get this, CVS, which is like the largest prescription pharmacy in the country, mm -hmm. they have their own PBM that they own called Caremark. So they're a pharmacy and an insurance company, and the insurance companies are insurance companies and PBMs this is an example, and you got to take this into your adult life, where you need to understand what's going on on a New York Times graduate level so that you don't get ripped off. So let me bring this down to a very practical level, okay? You need to understand this whole thing so that you can get your prescriptions filled and so that you don't get ripped off. Mm -hmm. High level? My, my, my advice to you going into the grown-up world is when the doctor says you need this medicine, you need to say, doctor, I want you to send that prescription to my neighborhood pharmacy. You can pick one, okay? Find one where you can walk in and know the name of the, of the pharmacist. Apparently, the local pharmacies do a little bit better than the massive chains. And why is that? Well, maybe... It's because those massive chains are paying their executives too much. Listen to this. The CEO of Cigna Group, right, which is the parent company to Express Scripts, was paid $21 million in total compensation in 2023. The CEO of CVS is a woman named Karen Lynch. She was paid $22 million in total compensation in 2023. Meantime, this, the median CVS employee, the people who work behind the counter, median, median income, $45,000. So the CEO is making 455 times as much as the people working in the store. That's a huge problem. That is totally upside down. And it's costing us something out of our pocket. It's right. also costing, there's a cost in terms of the quality of the care. It took me 10 days to straighten out a prescription. 
There's another prescription I couldn't even get at all, right? And I'm an intelligent person. I'm off my soapbox. That's the story with prescription drugs. You need to know what you're talking about. You need to understand this. It's a societal problem. It's an economic problem, and I don't see it getting straightened out anytime soon. Joe's not straightening it out. Kamala is not straightening it out. J.D. Vance is not even talking about it. <laughs> so good luck is all I can say out there. And if anybody has any thoughts on this, share them in the notes, share them in the comments. If you're uh, listening to this on, a, on the podcast, there's a text button you can press and send us a text message. What do you think? Overwhelming? Too much? Too much. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> like... What did you even just say? I'm saying this is a problem. This is a problem for people. And you ask me how I'm doing. That's how I'm doing. I'm totally frustrated. I go to the pharmacy and I can't get the prescriptions. Call the doctor. They're confused. They're angry because they have to call the pharmacy right. benefit manager. Oh, by the way, the pharmacy benefit manager, in addition to doing all those things I mentioned, they also operate online pharmacies. So they sell drugs on top of everything else. Yeah. I mean, I will say that... How do you sell drugs and also control the price? It shouldn't even be legal. I don't know. I've... Listen, I've... I, uh, I don't really know what to say. I'm not really asking you for a, a response except to say, isn't it impacting your life? Haven't you had a couple of yeah, prescriptions lately? Yeah, I've had lately? prescription issues in the last 30 days, and it's right. been a nightmare. It hasn't been a nightmare because it's always been solved, but it right. definitely has been annoying. I have missed several days of taking a medicine because there were delays, and yep. you know they couldn't get my stuff in time. They were completely understaffed, et cetera, et cetera. But. This kind of stuff bothers me. There's like a social layer to it. It has social implications. And one of the things they were saying in that CNBC thing is that uh, they're going to have to close a lot of CVSs. Yeah, I saw that. Because it's not as profitable as they used to be, like Boohoo. And you know why? There's a couple of reasons why they're not as profitable as they used to be. They're not as profitable. They need a rebrand, for not, sure. They're, they're not as profitable as they used to be because the pharmacy side of the business is less pros profitable than it once was. Counterintuitively, the TV advertised drugs are apparently not as profitable as the generic drugs. 91% of all prescriptions prescribed are generics, and the pharmacies do that because they make more money. It's a whole thing. There's a lot of money wrapped up in these things, Veronica, and that's I guess that's the message I got to try to get you to understand. It's like, don't be played. Don't be played. There's big money involved in these things, and when you're paying your executives $21 million a year, it doesn't leave a lot for everybody else. So what do you want me to do? Go to a local pharmacy? Go Mom to a and local pop? pharmacy. Mom and pop, if you can find a good one, because when you go to a local pharmacy, there's more like, they care more. Yeah. Because because the profit of that little business is going to pay for their own kids to go to college. It's going to pay for their own house. It's going to pay their own mortgage. It's a much more direct relationship than when you're paying, you know, $21 million a year for well, a CEO. Well, I mean, that goes with any anything, like a locally owned coffee shop. That yeah. goes with literally, that, that's just like how capitalism works. Yeah. It's well, always most, it's usually in your favor to shop small i'm for i'm so there's another reason why these stores are less profitable which is they they organize it into the front of the store and the back of the store so the front of the store is like gatorade beef jerky right birthday cards um the holiday decorations all that garbage that they sell in the front and then the back of the store is the pharmacy so the front of the stores are not profitable their yeah. stuff is expensive nobody likes half of it and you would know more about this than me, but these, like, the cosmetic stores, like Ulta and... Um, I know, you're just regurgitating what was in the video. Right, right, right. But no, but this is this is the story. This is why a lot of CVSs are going to have to close, because they've lost a lot of that front-of-the-store business to places like Ulta and Sephora that right. sell more expensive, more profitable cosmetics. Yeah, and people don't really care for drugstore makeup anymore there was a little bit of a drugstore makeup boom i think especially during covid when it was like okay where what's open and like mm -hmm. where can i go right but other than that yeah no. yeah so no love lost if they close the cvs now there's a whole social layer to it because there are pharmacy deserts apparently in some cities where you're a long distance from the nearest pharmacy and uh, inevitably those are the ones that they're going to close 
and they're I've locking been to up some of those cities and, with the pharmacy and, right. deserts. And they're and they're apparently they're locking up a lot of the product. BPO, apparently, you see it in our own place. We see it all the time. We see it at Target too. I can't oh my stand God, that. It's horrible. I can't stand that. Anyway, that to me, that's like that's like saying I don't need your business. Go to Amazon if you want to buy deodorant or whatever it is they're locking up. It's ridiculous. Yet we don't have Amazon Prime. We don't have Amazon Prime, but we do have access to the full Amazon Marketplace catalog, and it's all available on a three-day delivery for free. Free delivery. Okay. You know, free delivery is better than paid delivery, and that's just how I think about things. I try to be very conservative. Let me tell you, as soon as you get out there and you start paying rent, you're going to you're going to become fiscally conservative. I am too. fiscally conservative. Oh, really, for Sephora? I have not. I did go to the Sephora two weeks ago, but I bought one thing, and I don't go to Sephora like I used to. How much was the one thing you bought at Sephora? I don't remember. Maybe $16. Okay, what was and it? And I use it very conservatively. Uh, a makeup type No, item? it wasn't a makeup. It wasn't, wasn't a makeup product. It was a um, like soap scrub thing. All right. Well, uh, good for you. You know, good for you. It's, it seems like a very lovely place. I went into Sephora one time, and I felt like I was going to break out. The stuff was so expensive. I couldn't believe it. All right, so do you guys see why it's called the Sturridge Deal now? That was, that was... just spoke for 15 minutes. Right. You'll have to cut that down when you're editing this. I can't this. cut it down. You'll have to do something. I know I talk too much, but that's... No, but goal. that's... Okay, whatever. What else do you have today? Well, what else I have is there's apparently another uh, podcast uh, that's got this father-daughter theme. I don't know. I know you know about it because you told me about it a long time ago. But it's with David Bryan, who is one of the founders of the rock band Bon Jovi. Bon Jovi. Right. And his daughter, Gabby Ryan. Gabby Bryan. Oh, Ryan or Bryan? I believe it's Gabby Bryan because his name is David Bryan. So anyways, I told you about this. Three weeks ago, when right. I saw them on Good Morning Good Morning America, yeah. I said, Dad, there's another father-daughter podcast. You know what this guy said to me? Nothing. Nothing. Then he discovers it, and it's big news. Right. And I listened to an episode and a half, and it was very good. It's a good program. And you know what? There really are a lot of parallels. I don't want to say it's the same show. It's not. These are very different people. Their backgrounds are a little different professionally. There are some parallels. A quick story time here, okay? After I was in college, like right toward the end of college until I went to graduate school, I worked at Polygram Records. Mm -hmm. I, you've heard me tell that story before. I worked in the business affairs department. Now, at the time... Bon Jovi was the biggest act on, on Polygram. Hmm. I did. I don't remember meeting this guy, but it's entirely within the realm of possibility that I met David Bryan. Uh, it's very possible. It, it might have been the music publishing matter, or, or at some point they were in and out of the office on an occasional basis. Not not frequently, but it's possible I met the guy. So I'm watching this video. Uh, the, the listening to the podcast. It's a video podcast, another similarity. All podcasts are video podcasts. No, no, that's not true. Some podcasts are audio only. Plenty of them are still okay. audio only. Many are um, But many are video. And this one is, and it's a similar setup with the two chairs, although they, they, they use... Um, stands. They use mic stands, which, you know, we had that discussion. I yes. think we should use mic stands, but, you know, this is like, a, <laughs> this is a prop, and I understand this is how you like no, to No, but can roll. I just say one thing? I want to say this yeah. one thing. Yeah. We, I'm, it's not a competition, and, like, honestly, if you guys are out there and you want to, like, do a collab, let me know. <laughs> um, But we were doing the father-daughter thing before them, and their podcast is called Let Me Ask My Dad. That's That was the other thing. I couldn't find my notes. Let Me Ask My Dad, which is interesting because I had... Ask Dad Why. Ask Dad which Why. Which I came up with. Which you came up with, and that was the name that of was my like YouTube two channel. two years ago, it was three years ago? More, three, maybe three and a half years ago, until fairly recently, I was adding new videos to Ask Dad Why. I mean, I used that channel for all kinds of stuff. I did Bitcoin and live streaming and all sorts of things on Ask Dad Why. Mm -hmm. Um, as well as some explainer videos about these kinds of topics like prescription drugs and other things. And along comes David Bryan and Gabby Bryan, and they've got this really great podcast where it's about father-daughter talking about things in the world, answering questions like a dad. It's like fascinating, you know, so other people can have so the same idea. So did you idea. like it? 
I thought it was very good. Yeah. Oh, really? Yes, I did, I did think it was very good. I mean, David Bryan, her personality is very different than yours, but I do How see so? some some linkage. Well, David Bryan is about three years older than me. He grew up apparently in Jersey, um, musical background. And uh, Gabby Bryan, I guess, is a comedian now, and she's three years, a little about three years older than you. No, I think she's younger than me. No, I'll go back and check that out. But I just got some information here from Wikipedia. David Bryan Rauschbaum. Jew. Was, yeah, was born on February 7th, 1962 in Perth Amboy, New Jersey, and raised in Edison. His father played the trumpet. He was raised Jewish. He attended elementary school at Clara Barton, and then he went on to Herbert Hoover Middle School, J.P. Stevens High School, uh, wound up at Juilliard, right? T- talented guy. So what do you think they're doing well? I mean, here's the thing. We, we can't compare ourselves to them only because like they, uh, they obviously come with a, an fame. audience. Fame, fame, right? Yeah. I mean, he's a famous guy. He's a famous guy. He was in Bon Jovi all those years, all those hit records, and apparently he's had success on Broadway. Yeah. What did he, he do? He uh he worked bon on a musical with somebody named uh DePietro, uh Joe DePietro. Spider-Man? David David and Joe DePietro wrote the music for the musical Memphis. Oh, Memphis? He and, did Memphis? Yeah, and the duo won a Tony Award for oh be- for best original score. I love this that guy. musical. I didn't yeah, know that he did yep, Memphis. Yep. It was uh, apparently off Broadway in 2008. Memphis was we performed Memphis. in San Diego, blah 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 blah. blah. Brian co-wrote the musical The Toxic Avenger. Don't know that one. Collaborating again with Joe DiPietro, uh, which was off-Broadway in 2009. And then he worked, I guess this guy DiPietro must be like his musical partner. He wrote uh, a musical titled Chasing the Song, which chronicles American songwriters from 1962 to 1964. Very talented guy. No, we'll put the link in the show notes. He's got a great rapport with his daughter, they talk about the music type stuff, famous people stuff, but they also talk about like ordinary things that are going on in their lives, like we do. What's something that they talked about? Um, off the top of my head, I can't think of one of those specific topics, but they talk about like day to day stuff. Like, do they talk about questions. the weather? <laughs> I don't remember them talking about the weather. If they did, I don't remember it. Interesting. But it's possible that they did. <laughs> yes. I'm going to get my eyes on that show. Yeah. Maybe I'll, I'll send them a tag and be like, you let's should. collab. You should tag them and see if they, you know, go check out the show. And they've got, you know, they got a decent sized audience. They're getting some views. Yeah. All right. Um, I feel like this was a good episode today. Yep. Another episode of the Stern Spiel. And it, today was a spiel. Sometimes it's going to be a spiel, Veronica. Like I'm trying to, I'm trying to share things that I think will be meaningful to you. Okay, thank you. I All appreciate right. it. All right. All right. Let's let's close it out. Another episode of the Stern Stern. So closing it out means like, subscribe. All that great stuff, you know what to do. Um, if you want to hear us talk about specific topics, if you have ideas for us, put them into the comments, and uh, it's very likely that we will talk about them. Very Thanks, everybody. Bye.